Um, so welcome to IT140. This is, um, I, I'm a programmer at heart, so I think this is fun. Um, for those of you who are not programmers at heart, are new programmers, are in some, or in some cases being forced to take this because you have to for your degree, I'm here to help you get through the class um, as well as you possibly can. So I'm, I'm a resource on Thursday nights for anybody who attends this. Um, for my students who are in my sections of IT140, always reach out to, via email. Um, for the students who are in other sections, you should reach out to your instructor. I don't feel comfortable answering questions for another instructor. So um, let's talk about Python. So let's start off. And this is kind of the way this is going to go. I'm going to do a little presentation, and then we're going to go look at code. And I'm going to do presentation, and we're going to go look at code. So, we are in the beginning, um, and programming can be a lot of fun, but you have to understand the building blocks, and that's really what Module 1 is about. It's about teaching you the basic building blocks, and then every week we build on that with something new. So tonight we're just starting at the basics. What in the world is a program? Whether it's in Python, Java, C, C++, what is a program? Well, a program really consists of three things and three things only. It consists of input, process, and output. For the input, it's anything that comes externally into your script. And if we're talking about this class, that's going to be things like when I, if, if I'm grading, um, your project, I'm going to be inputting things. I'm going to be typing things on the keyboard. I'm hitting the enter key, and I'm going to expect to see them in your program. That's input. That's one type of input. Process is what I do with that input. Do I have calculations? Can I ask everybody to please mute? Do I, am I doing calculations? What am I doing for process? Now, some people think process is maybe just mathematical calculations. That really isn't, doesn't begin to scratch the surface. Because what you're going to end up doing in this class is beginning to learn how to write an algorithm. And an algorithm is a series of steps that make up an entire process. And they can be huge and they can be small. They can also be 2 plus 2. So, but that's what a process is. So a process takes what you have given the program and does something with it. And then the other thing that happens is output. Output is when you are taking the result of that input and that process and displaying it in some way or giving it to another piece in a much larger program. For us, Output means output to the console, output to the screen. And in Zybooks, it means that Zybooks captures that output and it tries to match it exactly with what you've given it. So your print statements are very, very important. And print is how we output. And I'll go through that a little bit more in a minute. So first building block is a variable. What's a variable? A variable is a bucket. That's why I have my pick bucket picture here. A variable is a bucket because it contains something. And there are properties about a variable just like there are properties in a bucket. A bucket, you know, can hold a gallon of water. That's a property. It's, it's um, how much can it hold. Um, so we have properties for variables in Python. So the first property is a name. Uh, a variable has to have a name or it doesn't exist. Um, and that has to be in your running script unique from all of the other identifiers or all of the other names that are out there. Two, a variable stores data. Okay, could I please have everyone mute? A variable stores data. Okay, can everybody please mute, or I'm just going to mute everybody. Uh, 
Okay, I think we're all muted now. And there are some questions. Okay, just a bunch of thank yous. Just checking I wasn't missing a question. Okay, so the variables are the building blocks. And a variable has a name. It stores data. That's the purpose of a variable. The only reason a variable exists is so you can put a value in that variable and um, pass it around by name. A variable exists in a specific scope, and we're not going to talk a lot about scope until the very end of the class. Um, well, we're not going to talk explicitly about scope. Starting week three, we got to know we we have to know something about scope, but we'll go through that in week three. Um, so that's the first building block. You have to have a place to put your data, um, and so here's just a rule. Has to a variable name has to start with a character, and you cannot have special characters in a variable name. So you can't like have an exclamation point. You can't have a space. You can't have the pound sign. So it's alphanumeric. It's um, letters and numbers only. Okay. So what how, what is this thing called a variable, and how do we define it? Well. A variable is just, in this case, a word. And the word I have is amount. And that's the variable name. Could have been Fred, could have been Chair, could have been anything that starts with a character and doesn't create, doesn't have special characters in it. Um, the next thing is there's an assignment operator. The assignment operator is a single equal sign. And in week three, you will understand why I'm saying single equal sign. Um, so the assignment operator says, I'm going to store something in this variable. Well, what am I going to store? Well, what I'm storing is the value. Hand side of the single equal sign or right hand side. On the left hand side of the single equal sign is always the variable name. In fact, you know it's a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. You have the single equal sign, and then you have the value on the right-hand side. So the separator is the equal. So if I talk about the left-hand side or the right-hand side, the left-hand side is always to the left of the assignment operator, and the value is always to the right. So what in the world happens in Python storage? Because Python has storage. The simple fact that it is running on a computer means that it has access to store things in RAM. And that's what we're talking about here. So what Python stores is first it stores the name, the name is amount, and then it stores the value. And the value is 10. And you can look at it like this. There are you know, little blocks in your Python program that store the name and the associated value. Now why do I want a name? Why can't I just pass around 10? So let's go and take a look at another example. This is actually from challenge 1.1, 1.2. Oh, and by the way, forgot to say it, you are not required to do the challenges. The challenges are, I strongly encourage you to do the challenges. They're a very helpful tool, but the challenges do not play any part in your grade. So if you can't get a challenge done, it's not going to affect your grade. And I will be using challenges in this class as my examples. Um, so how do I use this thing called a variable? Well, I use it in a program. And this is a program. This program is actually challenge 1.1, 1.2. What you see here, and we'll get more into a lot of these things later, is you see a series of things on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. These are all different variable names, okay? Which means I'm going to be storing different data in each of these variable names. And then I'm going to use those variable names to do something with. So I have total count, total coins, nickel count, dime count, and then total coins, which is the same as the one above it. Okay, the total coins equal to zero is kind of superflu superfluous in this example. 
um, but it's in the challenge, so I added it here. So what's the next thing? Well, the next thing is that assignment operator I was talking about. The assignment operator, and here is a pattern. You have variable name on the left-hand side, the assignment operator, and something that provides data on the right-hand side. Now, for nickel count and dime count, you're seeing this int input. Um, we're going to get to that a little later, but suffice it to say that that is how somebody can type at a keyboard and put the number 42, let's say, into dime count or 10 into nickel count. So then how do variables relate to one another? Well, by name, okay? So a, a variable has to be unique, and it is, um, so, hold on, sorry about that. When you see nickel count, it's nickel count everywhere. And so the value associated with nickel count travels around with its name. And we have dime count and we have total coins. So let's see if any questions. Yes, questions. Okay. Okay. Um, not much to talk. Okay. Thank you guys very much for taking care of all of that. I really appreciate it. So we have this thing called a variable, but if there's more to it. A variable has a type. Now, unlike languages like Java, Python is not a strongly typed language. So when I create this variable, I don't have to tell the language that I intend it to be a string or I intend it to be an integer. Instead, Python basically says, whatever value you put in there is the type. So we don't really have to worry about defining variables with specific types. We just have to know what those types are and how to manipulate them. So four types. That's all Python has is four types. You have a string, an integer, a float, and a Boolean. Boolean we'll get to in module three. String, ordered collection of letters. And in Python, it's got to be surrounded by quotes. An integer is a whole number. It's the number 42. And a float is a number with a decimal place. That's all they are. There's nothing mysterious about them. Integers and floats are pretty simple. Strings are a little trickier because of special characters, but we will get to that in a minute. Um, I'm just going to talk really quick about functions because we're about to start talking about how to use two different functions in Python. So I just wanted to tell you that Python provides a lot of functionality. The functionality it provides are in things called modules, and I know they talk about modules in this class, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on modules because there's so much to go over. We actually aren't going to spend a detailed amount of time on modules until uh, uh, week eight. Um, so the, the, we get all this functionality from Python, but the question becomes how do we use that functionality. Well, we use it by a function. So functions have a couple of properties. We've got a function name. We have an open parenthesis, a closed parenthesis, and sometimes there's something in between the parentheses. But this is just the basic format. And you're going to hear me harp a lot about balanced parentheses. Basically, that means if you have an opening left parenthesis, you have to have a corresponding closing right parenthesis. And in a few minutes, I will show you what errors you can get when that doesn't happen. So some of the first functions we're going to learn about is converting these types. So I have a string, um, and I can convert that string to an integer or a float. And I have an integer or a float, and I can convert it back to a string. Now, this becomes important when we're dealing with both input and output. Everything that comes into Python is a string. Everything that goes out of Python is a string. So if I am typing in the number 42 and I want to use it as an integer, I have to convert it. So you're going to start converting really soon. So in this case, my stir is 
42 in quotes. I'm going to convert it using a function called int. So the name of the function is int, shouldn't have clicked, sorry. And it has an opening left parenthesis, a closing right parenthesis, and the argument to it is the variable meister. Because the variable meister is um, holding the string value 42, because strings are always in quotes. Um, and what that gives me is it gives me the number 42. And when I have the integer 42, I can do math with it. I cannot do math with a string. Just, it can't happen. Python won't allow it. You will get a syntax error if you try and do that. I can also convert a string to a float. So if I put in 3.14, the function name is float. It has an opening left parenthesis. Meister is the um, argument and has a closing right parenthesis. So that's balanced. What happens? Well, I get the number 3.14. And again, I can now use that in mathematical operations. Before, I couldn't. And then we have, I want, sometimes I need to convert an integer or a float to a string. And that's the str function. So it's str, open left parenthesis, the integer that you want to convert to a string, and close parenthesis. And this one has, you're going to end up using this a lot in when you output things to the screen because Python is very, very persnickety about when it allows you to mix types on the output. It pretty much doesn't. You have to convert most of everything to a string. So I just started talking about these input and output things. So these are two more functions, okay? I have the function called input and a function called print. Input allows me to type on the keyboard and put get a piece of data in to the Python code so that I can you know, I'm on your project and I say go north. I'm Go north only happens if I've got an input statement because that's the only time that your program's going to stop. And input says, hold up Python, stop for just a minute. Um, and print goes the opposite way. It's the output. So it's going to give it to you on the computer screen. So, where are we now? All right. So, actually, I think what I'm going to do, I shouldn't have gone all the way to input real quick. I'm going to go and show you some. Okay. Yes, convo is the variable name. And int is what does the conversion. Thank you very much. I hope I, I say this right. Harmony? Harmony? Harmony, now that I say it. Um, I took this database structures last term as this. Yes, it is similar, but MySQL isn't as broad of a language, um, or SQL isn't as broad of a language. So um, let me do this, and then we're going to open up PyCharm. So PyCharm is what you are going to be using when you are not using Zybooks in this class. Um, and so I use it for all my examples because you're going to have to use it. Now, what is this in front of me? Well, let's take a little quick look at PyCharm. PyCharm, when you create a file, it creates it in module, puts it in some directory someplace. Um, and speaking of that, I often have students who, who don't understand how to get, the, get to their PY file, especially when they have to submit it. Well, you can look right here, and it will tell you where it is. Or you can hit Control, and I know I'm on a Mac, but I can say Reveal in Finder, or you can probably say Open Directory, or whatever they say on Windows. So um, that's where we are. These are all of the files underneath my project. And yes, those are all going to be out linked on Google Drive. And the links are in the description under the video. Um, and so that's to my left-hand side. 
To my right hand side here is my code. This is a terminal window that will allow me to run Python. Um, well, it's not really a terminal window. It's an IDE window. So I have something called variable.py. Variable.py is just a function I wrote, or sorry, a script I wrote, and I want to run that script. So first thing, I need to go up here and edit the configuration. And by the way, there are good instructions um, uh, on Brightspace about how to get PyCharm and how to download it and install it. And there are some good YouTube videos out there on using PyCharm. So those are two resources I, I think it would be good um, if you took a look at before week two because on week two, you're going to have to install this next week and you're going to have to write some code on it. So I have a um, Python script called variable.py. Variable.py just has a couple lines of code. I have this thing that says myvar equals 10. I'm going to print myvar, and this just has an end with a quote in it, and we'll see. This is important, and we'll see why when we go over some of the labs. Okay. Um, Rebecca, you're going to need to get PyCharm, and it's free, by the way. There's a PyCharm Community Edition. It's completely free, and you can download that, and you can install. This class uses Python 3.6. So you're probably going to need, well, you are going to need to have Python 3.6, but I believe that PyCharm will install that at the same time it installs the IDE. Uh, okay. So we're on variable.py, and this is code. That's, that's what a Python script looks like. Okay, sorry. Oh, thank you very much, Tiffany. Um, sorry, I'm going here between windows. All right, so let's take a look real quick and run this code. So PyCharm gives us a few things. It gives us this little arrow, which is run. In IDE world, almost all of them have a single right pointing arrow for run. We have debug, which allows us to step through the code, and I debug code all the time. Debug is my friend. So if I want to, I can run the debugger, and I always want to run the debugger. So um, I hope everybody can see the code. Okay. It's a little harder to see down here, but we have this thing called a console, and we have frames and variables, and variables is something that I keep open a lot. So I'm just going to, I'm not doing an input yet, which is why I wanted to stop and do this. But you'll see I have a variable called myvar, and the value is 10. So if you look down here after I stepped over a line of code. So let me, um, Python execute, executes lines of code as it comes to them. Um, so when you're running it, each line of code is going to do something and there will be a result from that something, whether that's just changing the memory space in PyCharm so that you have a variable called myvar that equals 10, or whether it's doing a large computation. It doesn't matter. It's underlying the same thing. Python is executing a line of code. So I just executed line 3. I am now at line 5 because there was nothing at line 4, and I'm going to use this little button here, and I'm going to step over. But before I do that, I'm going to go to the console because that print statement is going to print 10 to the screen. It was right down here. And then I'm going to say myvar. By the way, it's the same as the other myvar because they're both, they're, they're the same thing because they're um, the same string. So if I step over, Line 7, you will see that the value of myvar has changed. I'm going to now output myvar, so it's going to output 12. And then I'm just printing 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's the end of the program.
Okay. Good advice, everyone. So we're going to go back to input and output really quick. So how to call the input function? Well, the input function is a special function because it halts. We're not, remember when you saw me walking through those lines of code just a second ago? The input halts that process. It says, I'm going to wait for somebody to, give, to, to hit the enter key on the keyboard before I go any further. So this is from 1.3.4. Um, and basically what we have is we're going to have, we have a line of code, num1 equals int input. So input is the input function we're talking about. Int converts whatever I put in to the code to an integer because I need it to be an integer if I'm going to do math with it. So I have a variable name. I have two function names because you can call one function from inside the other. I have a series of open parentheses and I have a series of closed parentheses. And I've got Professor Lisa down here in the left hand corner and she's just entered the number two. It's a number two to me, but it has to go through all of that before it becomes an integer to in Python. And this is input. Remember I said input process output? That's input. So now I have a second line of code. Num2 equals int um, input. So I'm going to get something in and convert it to an integer and store that in, the va in variable num2. So I'm going to input 4. So num1 is 2 and num2 is 4. That's also input. So now I'm going to do process. I'm going to print num1 plus num2. That's my process. The actual process part, well, num1 and num2, they, we, we carry those values with those names. And num1 and num2 is process even though it's inside of a print statement. And then we have output. And when we do the output, we're outputting something to the screen. In this case, it's outputting it to 6, to the uh, monitor, and we're done. So if I want to look at the associated script in PyCharm, oh, you guys are talking about PyCharm. Okay. So if I want to, uh, this was 3.14. So let's, let's watch the execution of this. So the first line of code, by the way, is line 13. All of this stuff in green up here are comments. And comments are lines of code that are net, well, sorry, comments are lines in your program that are never executed because we tell Python not to execute them by either putting a pound sign to the left of whatever I'm typing or to enclose it in triple quotes. And um, Zybooks talks about this a lot. I don't really talk about it much because um, of time. So I want to run 3.14, which is what I just showed you. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to edit my configuration to do 3.14. What hard, sorry, 1.3.4. And now I'm going to do this again. I'm going to debug it because I love the debugger. And you will see on the debugger there's a blue line. This blue line on the debugger means that Python has stopped processing and it's waiting for you to tell it to go to the next thing. Okay? So I'm going to step over it. And you'll notice now there's red, but there's no blue. There should have been another blue line. Why wasn't there another blue line? That's because of this input function. This input tells Python, I don't care what you're doing, stop and wait for somebody to hit the enter key. So I'm going to type in 42. I'm going to hit the enter key. Now, PyCharm just did something very nice for me. It gave me the variable name and the value associated with that variable. 
So I now know that num1 is 42, but also I can look down here under variables and see that num1 is 42. So now I'm going to step over line 14. That's just a little bent arrow is step over. Step over tells Python to execute this line of code. While it's blue, nothing's happening. The program is stopped. Nothing's going on. When that line is no longer blue, it means that Python has done something with that line of code. It's executed it. So I'm stepping over. Again, no blue line. No blue line in this case means that it's waiting for another input. So I'm going to make my input um, three. I don't know. So now I'm back to a blue line, and I have print num1 plus num2. So I'm going to step over this. It's going to print out 45, and the program has stopped. So that's 1.3.4. What time is it? I'm not going very fast. So we're going to go over, but that's okay. So we just looked at the print function. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about it. The print function is for us how we get things out of the program, how we tell somebody what happened that's sitting behind the keyboard. Now, these are primitive, okay? You will not be using print function, function except for when you are, you know, maybe doing log messages or something. When you're writing your, when you're, when you're professional writing, let's say, a multi, massively multiplayer game. When you use your game here, you're going to be using print and input a lot. So this one is 3.1, sorry, 1.3.2. Okay. The print function can be called two ways. It can be called, well, it can be called multiple ways. But the most common ways are it's called with a single argument. That argument in this case is a string. It's just print three, two, one, go, exclamation point. I have the function name print. I have an opening parenthesis. I have an argument. In this case, it's everything in quotes because that's a string. And then I have the closing parenthesis. Now, and it's just going to, you know, three, two, one, go. That's what it's going to do. That's what it's going to print out to the screen. Um, I'm going to call the print function with two arguments. And this is something that's a little different and that you will find out you're going to need. Um, this is, I have two lines of code. The print function is the function I'm using on each line of code. I have, I'm, I've ignored putting the, the bubbles for parentheses for this one because that was just too many bubbles. So I have an argument, one, I have a comma, and I have a second argument. And what this is going to give me, it's just going to give me line one. And it's going to give me a space because that's what that end means. And then, I'm going to print continued. Now, why is this important? Well, the print function automatically gives you a new line. So on the console, you will automatically go to the next line down. Um, sometimes you don't want to do that. So that's why there's that end equal there, because you can tell it to have a different ending than a new line. And I believe that's one of your labs for, in one of your labs this week. Okay, so here are a couple rules. Every open parenthesis, you've got to have a closed parenthesis. I know I've said that three times, and I'm probably going to say it some more times tonight. Print ends in a new line until you tell it not to. All arguments are separated by comma, and the end tells print not to use a new line, but to use something else, and in this case, a space. Okay, secret life of a Python script. You're going to calculate some calories. So we're going to back, going back to input, process, and output. So teacher Lisa is going to print input $20 for hourly wage. And then I'm going to calculate yearly wage. And I, it's going to be 4000 
and I'm going to calculate uh, monthly, which is going to be like 3200 and then I'm going to output the annual salary and the yearly salary. Sorry, that's the yearly. And then I'm going to print monthly salary. Now, I'm not going to go through every single one of the examples that we have here because we'll more than run out of time. So I'm going to keep going. If there's a specific one you want me to show you in code, I will. And then when we get to 1.7, we'll go through that in code as well. Okay, so we end. There's a difference between statements and expressions. And this is kind of like um, just programmer speak. Uh, a statement is generally where you are just like setting a variable. An expression is where you're doing some form of a calculation. Generally, that's the way it is. Um, this is just something that it's important to know that th this terminology exists, but I'm not going to spend any more time on it than this. Okay, cases and spaces matter. All right. Python is a case-sensitive space delimited language. What in the world does that mean? Case-sensitive means that if you have a lowercase x equal to, it is not the same as an uppercase x equal to. Those are two completely separate things. Also, space delimited means that you don't have anything that tells you where the end of the line is. Where, where Python should stop assuming that one line of code is written and where the next one starts. So it uses a new line to do that. Um, and there are also some other things that we'll get to in the coming weeks. But So I have my x equal 2 here, and I have my y equal 4. That is completely valid code. However, if I say x equal 2 space y equal 4, that is not valid code because those are two statements on the same line. There's no new line in between them. And there's a thing called cases and spaces we can go through if you want. So not, our, not all characters are visible. Why am I talking about this? Well, because we're going to have to do some string manipulation next week, and I want to get the, the basis of that down, okay? Every character that we can create on a keyboard has a numerical equivalent. And they start at zero, and for ASCII, they go to 120. Gosh, I can't remember. It's really bad. I can't remember the number of characters in the ASCII table. Anyway, um, the numeric part of the expression just allows the computer to deal with it. The the underlying part of a computer doesn't know what an A is. It knows that A has a numerical representation, and that's what it stores. It's, an, it's called an abstraction. When we have A on our keyboard, but the computer knows that it's 39 or whatever it is. So that also makes it so that characters that I can't see and you can't see, like a new line, or a tab, the computer can handle because it's not handling a new line or a tab. It's handling what it's supposed to do when it gets the number 9 or it gets the number 10. So that's why there's a numeric representation. And it's just an important background to understand that, partly because as you move along out of this class into your programming journey, you may have to understand how to deal with, and you will have to understand how to deal with, non-visible and special characters. So there is handling special characters. So there's the backslash. Backslash is your friend, and you're going to be really friendly with it next week. Um, and basically, anything inside of a string um, we're considering as a character. That's what Python considers it, except, okay? If you're inside quotes and you want to print a backslash, you have to print two backslashes. If you want to have the same quote in a string, 
that is surrounding that string, you have to backslash it. Um, and that's for single quotes or double quotes. A new line is a backslash N, and a tab is a black backslash T. So those are just some things to know. They are on 1.19. And then arithmetic operators. If you've done math, if you've done even small, you know, just a little bit of algebra, you've seen this before. The only thing that's a different operator is um, the double star, which is the exponent. But we really don't use exponents much in this class. So you have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponent. Um, you'll also see things like modulo, and that's not module, that's modulo, which we will use some next week. Um, no, we'll use the floor, floor operator next week. So, and, and basically we follow the same thing as meta. Parentheses work the same when you're doing math in Python as when you're doing it in your algebra class. Um, so those rules are all the same. Oops. So now we're going to go through the labs and then we're going to go through, um, how are we doing for time? We're doing good. Then we're going to go through, well, I guess I'll put this out for a question. Do you guys want to go through labs or do you want to go through some more code right now? Yes, input is considered a method. Tiffany. I say function, function and method are interchangeable in my vocabulary. Ah, oh, thank you for the ASCII table, Tiffany. All right, we will go through some code and then we'll come back and we'll do the lab. So, cool. All right. Do I have 1.7? I had 1.7 here. Um, yes. No problem. Okay. Thought I had 1.7. Okay. So let's see. 4.1. Well, let me ask this: Have there have any of you tried any of the challenges and found them to be difficult? And if so, which ones? And we'll go through them. Um, let's see. We talked about outputting. Where's the input ones? Okay. So let's go back through our nickel count. Okay. So this is 1.1, uh, 1.2. And I am just going to... Uh, go through this and we will walk through it in the debugger and see what happens in the console. So first I'm going to go find it in my projects. 1.1.2. Okay. That's okay. If you can um, remember which one it is, that would be great. If not, that's okay too. Um, all of the challenges will be linked. So I'm going to use the debugger on this program. I have um, I've made the the I've told the runner to use this particular Python file. So the debugger is up here in the right-hand corner, and it's the thing that looks like a little bug. That's how you know it's a debugger. Um, and when I want to run with the debugger, I simply hit the, that button, and I get some stuff down here. I get the console. I get the frames and values, which has the frames, which I don't use much, but I use values all the time. So one thing you will notice down here is that there's nothing under variables yet. And that's because I haven't created any. And I haven't created any because Python has yet to run a single line of code. It's, it hasn't done anything. So 
I'm going to use this button. It's the crooked arrow, and it is step over. And step over just says, hey, Python, execute that code. So I have total coins now going to be zero. So now I have nickel count equals int input. So what it's going to do is it's going to, um, sorry, that's my dog sneezing. It's going to now execute line seven, but at executing line seven means the program is going to stop. So the program has stopped, and I'm going to put in a nickel count of two. Sorry. <laughs> no, you can't see the dog. That's okay. Um, there does not need to be any spaces. I For readability, I use that. I use spaces for readability. Okay, back to this. So we have nickel count, sorry, we have nickel count, which is now two, and when I step over dime count, I'm going to put in four, and you'll see that nickel count is two and dime count is four. So now I can execute this line of code, and here's another very handy thing on PyCharm. If you just put your mouse and let it hang over a variable, it will tell you the value of that variable at any given point in time. So it'll tell you while it's executing that line of code what to expect if you know if you know what the algorithm is. So we're going to um, step over total coins and we're going to go down here we've got this total coins now it's six and this is another nice thing about variables it will tell you what all your variables are and what their values are, and what their types are. Everything's an int, which is what it should be. And then I'm going to print total. So, and there's a couple of things I want to show you about, um, about errors. So I'm going to mess this up, and then I'll put it back before you guys need to worry about using it. 1.3, well, input output. The so lab 10, I don't get the code to continue to print the next time. Okay, the bottom toolbar on PyCharm does not look like the example step over option. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe it looks different because I'm on a Mac. It may also look different because I've changed how I view things. Let's see, window. Yeah, you can change your tabs and what you pin and things like that. All of that can be changed, and I've probably just set this, this look up a while ago. Um, so I'm going to break this. I'm going to do a little breaking so we can see what what a broken script does and how to get out of it. So first of all, I'm just going to remove that. Now in PyCharm, first of all, let me, yeah, in PyCharm, all of a sudden you're going to see this red squiggly line. The red squiggly line means there's syntax error here and it's not going to run. Now you won't see anything down here in the console until you try and run it. So if I try, and I'm just going to run this, this is the right arrow that kind of, yeah, it's just a triangle with like a right arrow head. When I hit this, it's just going to run it. It's not going to stop unless there's a problem or there's an input statement. So I'm going to run it, and what you see down here, I know it's kind of hard to see because it's small, um, you have an invalid syntax there's an error there and Python can't continue. It's going to stop and that's what it did. The program is not running, it is completely stopped and it stopped because there's a problem. What's the problem? The problem is there's no value. When you define a variable, it has to be variable name, assignment operator, value and there's no value. So I'm going to put the value back in and the red squiggly line goes away. Now, what happens if I take away a parenthesis, well, let's try running it. 
So, interesting thing here that you need to look out for when you're debugging. You'll see that it says that there's an invalid syntax and it's pointing to dime count. And I can look at this program right now and tell you that there's nothing wrong with dime count. There's nothing wrong with line 8. And there's nothing wrong because Python didn't figure out there was something wrong until it got to line 8. Um, I've written a programming language in the past, and I can tell you for a fact that computer programmers are horrible about writing error messages. And um, so this is not going to be real helpful sometimes. However, if you know that dime count is right, look back to the next line and then look back. Because sometimes it may be several lines above when the error really is happening. So that's something important to remember is that something as simple as a not having balanced parentheses, because all I did was remove one of the two right closing parentheses, can actually mess your program up and, it, and Python may not catch it. It may not catch it for a while. So um, if, you, if you're looking at your line of code and it looks right, look back to the one before it. Um, I, I think that students often get caught and get frustrated when they see something like this and they're looking at, the, at line 8 and saying there's nothing wrong with dime count. And they're exactly right. There's nothing wrong with dime count. There is something wrong with line 7. So, whoops. Okay. Nothing wrong with line 7. So now I want to do something else. And this kind of has to do with the values in the variables. So far, right now, if I run this, it's going to stop, and it's going to, I'm going to say 2, and I'm going to say 4, and it's going to output 6. Well, if I did that's okay. I'm allowed to do that, and I will get 2, 4, and wait a minute. It's not okay. It looked okay. I didn't get any squiggles on line 12. So why isn't it okay? Well, remember when I told you that output was a little persnickety? This is where output is persnickety. All right? So I have this type error. This is not a syntax error. This is a runtime error. Okay? Which means it will only happen, Python will only figure it out while it's actually running. Whereas before... Python or an IDE like PyCharm can say, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem. That's a syntax error when you can see it in PyCharm, when the syntax is not correct. There are other things where your program is completely syntactically correct, but you get this runtime exception. And that's, in this case, it's saying, hey, you cannot concatenate a string and an A. You can only concatenate two strings. Well, what does concatenate mean? Concatenate is the process of taking one string and putting it right back onto the, the next one. So I have the total is, and let me do this. The total is, and then I want to add total coins because I wanted to print out the total is, colon, space, and then whatever the total is. So this makes complete sense to me. But Python won't let me do it. To do that, I have to use one of those conversion functions, in this case, sir, because I need it to be a string. So I'm now saying the total is, and then I have the stir function, and I'm going to put total coins as the thing that I want to convert, because I want it to be 42 in quotes and not just the number 42. So I'm going to run this again, and I'm going to put in 2 and 4, and the total is 6. So that was an example of a runtime exception. And your code looks beautiful. It's completely right, except there's this thing that Python won't let you do. Um, runtime exceptions are pretty dead on to the line that they happen on. So unlike syntax errors, where you might have to look back a couple of lines, um, the runtime errors, that's where you got to look. 
If that's where it's saying that there's a type error, then that's where there is a type error. Okay. So that um, yeah, I, guess I wanted to show them that. So how about we spend a little time looking at the labs, and then I'll everybody can open their mic up afterwards, and we can you can ask questions, we can talk programming, whatever you would like. So I'm going to start going through the labs. So, and these will be up as part of the presentation, but I also put screen, um, JPEGs of them up as well, so you don't have to go through the whole presentation just to find the, the flow of the lab that you want. And this week has a lot of labs. Um, it's got the most of any weeks. So, what am I supposed to do for Lab 1.9? Well, first thing I need to do for Lab 1.9 is understand what I'm reading. So there are a few clues here. It says, complete the program to read four values from input. So when it's talking about reading values or input, it is talking about using the input function. Okay? You're going to store those values in, in variables, and they're giving you the variable name. First underscore name is a variable name. Second underscore name is a variable name. Um, sorry, generic location is a name. Whole number is a name, and plural noun is a name. And then you're going to output a short story, which the lab tells you how to do. So this is basically a flowchart of what the lab, of the steps that you need to take. So the first step you need to take is you're going to input first name. So you want to go back either in this lecture or in PyCharm and look at how to use that input function. And the variable name is first name. And then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to input generic location. You're going to input whole number. You're going to input plural noun. And then you're going to output all of that based on how they've suggested you do it in the lab. So in this case, you'll notice there's no process. It's just all input and output. And that's completely valid. You won't find that happening very much. Um, there's usually process but in, in out in the real world, but here it's, I mean, it's valid. Okay, so lab 1.10. So it's got a couple of parts, and you're going to take in a variable user number that's going to store an integer, and then you're going to um, output what the user input, and then output the squared and cubed um, values, and then your going to get another user input and output the sum and the product. So the flow of this, oh sorry, an output means use the print function. Okay, when it says get user input or it's, um, you know, so if it's get user input, it's an input function. If it's output, it's the print function. So I'm going to start, I'm going to input user num, and then I'm going to square it, and then I'm going to output the squared. Whoops, got my stuff out of order. Then I'm going to cube user num. I'm going to output cubed, and then I'm going to input user num2, and I'm going to create the sum, and I'm going to output the sum, and then I'm going to multiply the two together, and I'm going to output the product, and I'm going to end. So this is the flow for 1.10, and it's a little longer, and we're doing different user inputs. Now, when they talk about how you're outputting things, you need to pay attention because Zybooks is, is, is not very smart. It, all the spaces have to be there. If it's a new line, the new line has to be there. If it's a colon, the colon has to be there. So Zybooks is very, very picky about the output because that's how it grades you. If your output is not exactly what Zybooks is expecting, then it's not going to give you the credit. Now, for people in my class, and I can't speak for other professors, just for the people in my class, um, I give you partial credit. So try. 
if even if you don't think you can get it, try because you will get some amount of points for having tried. Okay, lab 1.21, and we're going to have integers usernum and x as input. So we're going to use the input function twice, and we're going to output usernum divided by x three times. So we're going to use print function, we're going to use the input function twice. So here is the flow, and my arrows are all backwards. I'm going to input usernum. I'm going to input x. So I'm going to divide usernum by x. I'm going to output that. I'm going to divide usernum by x again. I'm sorry, this time I'm going to divide div by x. Then I'm going to output div2, because div2 is the product of div divided by x. And then I'm going to create a variable called div3, and it's going to be div2 divided by x, and then I'm going to output div3. And I'm going to end. So 1.22, it's just, it, it's very similar. You're going to have inputs and outputs, and in this case, you're going to have a calculation for calories. And the calculation for calories is provided in the, um, in the lab description. So I'm going to have one input for each of the variables, and I'm going to have a single output at the end. So I'm going to start. Input age, weight, heart rate, time. Then I'm going to calculate calories. That calculation is provided in the script. I'm going to output calories using that exact thing. So here's something to remember about 1.22. You will see calories in lowercase here. That needs to be the value that you're calculating. So your variable name is going to be calories with a lowercase c when you do this calculation. And then you end it. Okay? So now we have another multi-part one, and, we're, and it's basically you're just inputting a couple of numbers, and then you're going to print them in a specific order some numbers and letters. So I'm going to input the user int because I'm inputting an integer. I'm going to input a float. So when you input the integer, you have to convert it to an int. You have to use the int function. When you're inputting that float, you're going to have to use the float function with the input function inside of it um, because the result of an input function call is a string. So you have to change it. Um, so we input the user stir, then we're going to output things in one order, we're going to output them in the other order, and then we're going to convert user int to a character. Hint, check out the care function, and if you need more information, there's a URL. W3Schools is a really good reference for a lot of stuff, and python.org is as well. I'm going to output character. I'm going to output the character that I um, put in, and then I'm going to end. So this is the flow for 1.23. Oops. Yes. So. Okay. Uh, let me go back and get to the last one. Oops. Hold on. Okay. Um, yes, you can input. You, you can submit your work as many times as you want. If you are, um, the, the way the policy works for Zybooks, for, and this is just for Zybooks activities and labs, you can, we will accept them up to two weeks after they were originally due, but you will have late penalties. 
So if you are struggling with something, let's say, and you are working with a tutor for a given week and it's, you're not going to be able to meet with them on time, you can still get credit. Always do something because there is still some credit. And the participation activities, just keep changing the answer and submitting it until they're done. Oh, kids can code. I actually didn't know about that one. So I'm going to open it. Everybody can open up. I'm going to unmute everybody. You're welcome to. Um, hey, you might want to mute me. My cat is really loud. Okay. You can go ahead and mute yourself. Oh, that works. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions uh, or would like to discuss anything? Um, so this is Rebecca. I'm still having issues with my pie charm. Okay. So um, did you try and download pie charm? Yes, ma'am. So I downloaded the newest version of Python, and then on my pie charm, when I open it up, it's still giving me Python 2.7 for the interpreter. Okay. You'll probably just have to install a new interpreter. Mm-hmm. And you can do that in PyCharm, uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where it is here. There's a settings or properties. It's in the bottom right corner. Ah, you're spectacular, thank you. So when I click okay. on that one, and then I- Where it says the Python 3.8. Um, I'm, I'm still only seeing 2.7, but in my folders, my, I, it says Python 3, 3.10. Okay, so Py, your PyCharm is not, um, is not recognizing that you downloaded that because Python, you haven't actually told it the interpreter is available in PyCharm. Oh, okay. So you have to tell PyCharm that the interpreter is available and I can't find that right now. But um, the setting for it is down in the bottom where it says Python 3.8. Okay. You see that? Click that. Ah. There okay. you go. Project interpreter settings. Okay. Thank you very much. So no this problem. This is where you would do interpreter settings. Thank you. I always look for it up here in the. That's just old school though. So with that one, um, when I hit like the show all or if I do the interpreter settings, am I just going to the Python 3.10 folder and adding yes. it? Yes. Yeah, okay. you're just going to add an interpreter here. Okay, mm -hmm. so you would settings, add, and point it to that folder. Okay, so then when I go to add it to that folder, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't really want to hold everyone up. So go ahead and add it, and then it should allow you to use Python 3. And for the person who asked, um, any version of 3 will do. I think the Zybook is still on 3.6, but the Python 3s are completely backward compatible. So when I point it to the folder, it's not letting me select OK. <laughs> OK, so there's probably a permission problem okay. on your system. So you may need to move where that is stored. OK? OK, okay. thank you so much. No problem. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Are there any challenges or anything you want to see? Or is everybody's brain burned out? I actually had a question about working ahead. Uh huh. So, do you still get the like? I just want to make sure that I wasn't going to shoot myself in the foot. Um, so, if I start working into like module two or module three, like ahead of time, um, I'm still going to get credit for those things when those you know like modules become due, right? Because I've already completed that work. Yes. At that point, okay, great. Now. Zybooks, we're doing something new this year with Zybooks, and I'm still not 100% sure how it's supposed to work. So when you are done with an activity, 
um, so when you are done with a participation activity and you hit submit, it actually begins to send the cumulative grade for the participation activities over to Brightspace. So Bryce may you may you may do a couple of participation activities you know at night and then the next day go and all of a sudden you're looking and you're seeing but wait a minute you know I've already been graded for this and I've only got you know 10 percent that's actually not the instructors this year Zybooks is going to auto grade those so don't be surprised if your grade is changing as you're working on them. Yeah, I noticed that. Thank you. No problem. Um, and if you do have any questions, as always, reach out to your instructor. Um, does anybody have any other questions, any places you're getting stuck? OK, going once, going twice. I hope you guys got something out of this. Everybody have a good evening. This video should be up on my YouTube channel with the link sometime tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, where is the lead? Thank problem? you. No problem.